When I became a judge in 2000, one of my chief justices who was from the Patna High Court said that you're the last on the bench of 42 judges of the Bombay High Court as it then stood. So you are the guard babu. We call the last judge to be appointed as the guard babu. We have seven guard babus in the Supreme Court. <laughs> but hopefully not for long, because one of my missions has been to ensure that this full-strength Supreme Court is not an aberration, but a regular feature of the Supreme Court. There's absolutely no justification or reason for the Collegium to keep even a single vacancy unfilled in the Supreme Court, and that will be my mission for the future as well. These appointments which you have marked today by this felicitation function reflect truly the diversity of the nation. Our colleagues come from diverse states, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Gujarat, Himachal, Karnatak, Maharashtra, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Manipur, Punjab and Haryana, Rajasthan, and Telangana. I'm including both their parent states and the states where they have worked as chief justices. 13 states and the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. What a sense of diversity that this brings to the court. I was just doing a little bit of a mathematical calculation, and I had my cell phone to help me do that. All our colleagues today have been appointed between 2006 and 2011 as judges of the high courts. If you make a sum total of their cumulative experience as judges, it works to about 121 years, the cumulative experience, 121 years, 13 states, one of the Union territories. So this gives you an idea of the diversity and the depth of the experience which our colleagues bring to the bench. It is important to say this because very often we are criticized as the collegium and as the institution in regard to the source from which we make judicial appointments. We are criticized on the ground that we are not diverse enough, we are not democratic enough. I ask myself a simple question. What other tribute to diversity can you have than my eight colleagues who are present today on the dais? We also have some fantastic cricket players, so the lawyers be better beware of the next cricket match. <laughs> I was in fact delaying responding to Mr. Vikas Singh's request for a cricket match because I knew we were going to get some top-notch cricketers from the high courts. <laughs> we began this morning with a celebration of Justice Anirudh Bose's birthday. Being a judge is some, somewhat like being in school. You get into the class when the bell rings and you get up when the bell rings, except that you don't get up until your usher moves your chair and tip, taps you on the back. So we began this morning with a nice chocolate and orange cake, which was organized by Justice Sanjay Kaul. He's our most imaginative uh, morning uh, cake provider on days of birthdays. And we now end the day with this felicitation, because I'm not planning to go back to chambers this evening. What a beautiful day to, uh, for all of us in our lives. I just thought I'll spend the next few minutes. We've already listened to all our colleagues and the felicitations for them. I don't want to add to much that they have said. But since a few thoughts were expressed by the members of the bar and as chief justice, as the head of the family, how can I not refer to some of these issues, which I'm sure all of you are thinking about? Very often, the members of the bar come and meet me, whether it's the SCBA or the SCORA. I met the representatives of the SCORA just last week. And when they put their demands to me, I said, my problem is that I can't say no to any of the demands of the bar, because that's the lawyer within me which is constantly saying how justified these demands are. But then, over the last five months, there's also a chief justice in me who has an institutional perspective at heart. 
So there is a little bit of a conflict sometimes in the heart between me as a lawyer and me as an institutional head, and I try and have to balance out both the perspectives. I must share with you that in everything that we do, we consult the bar and we'll con continue to consult the bar. Because these offices which we hold, we hold in trust for all of you, for the present, for the future, and for the nation. We are planning to address the severe shortage of space in the Supreme Court by putting up an annexe building, a new annexe building. We asked the PWD to draw up a initial blueprint. As someone mentioned earlier, my successors who are going to be chief justices, several of them are part of the committee. They bring diverse experience, very rich and profound experience as part of the building committee. The PWD did the first drawing, which was only for our internal discussion. We've got back to the PWD and said that our mission was very clear and our instructions were very clear. We said that the primary emphasis in the new building has to be on providing adequate space to the most important stakeholders, namely the lawyers and the litigants. I'm conscious of the fact that the bar is in dire need for more space. Therefore, I told the PWD that we have to have, first and foremost, adequate facilities for the Supreme Court Bar Association, for the SCORA. And though the women lawyers are members of both the associations, or at least one of them, I do believe that the women require a space of their own, so we must have adequate space for the Women's Bar Association. We have also said that the entirety of the building, I'm conscious of the fact that in the heat of the summer, as we leave the air-conditioned courts where we are sitting, the lawyers have to go into terribly hot corridors. That's an area which I am also working on. I can't promise you that we'll find a technological solution, but I'm working on it. But most important in the new building, we have given the remit to the PWD to ensure that the entirety of the building would be air-conditioned, and on every floor there would be waiting areas for lawyers and litigants, so that you do not have to crowd into the courts and you can sit quietly outside the court waiting for your matters to reach and work on your laptops or work on your briefs, whether you are on paper or otherwise. A Couple of things which I must mention that we are in the process of doing. We are substantially at an advanced stage in implementing e-filing of cases. But as in all other things that I've implemented in the last five months, nothing is done by my fiat. Everything is done in consultation with the bar. Though the e-filing module is substantially designed, I wouldn't say that it is perfect. We thought that we must have awareness programs of the members of the bar so that they can look at the e-filing module respond to us, and over the last few days, we've had some wonderful suggestions. And I also request, I've in fact asked the registry to invite the president of SCBA and the executive committee at one session, and likewise the president of SCORA and the executive committee of SCORA, so that your suggestions can be incorporated into the e-filing module. And I hope that these, with these suggestions, we held a hackathon a short while ago. We're gonna have another hackathon now, and some Fine suggestions came from the members of the bar at the first ever hackathon which we held in the Supreme Court of India. We have, as you know, put out the ESCR, which is a free service for the members of the bar. I was conscious of the fact that young lawyers may not be able to afford the, the subscription costs which have to be paid to any of the private reporters. So we have put out the ESCR, which I would request all the young junior members of the bar to use prolifically, because this is a free service which is available to you. The head notes are now complete right up to 2023. And we are ensuring that we will not fall behind on head notes. So please do use the ESCR facility. Just today, and I hope none of you has to ever use it, the defibrillators which I had requested the government of Delhi to uh, organize have come in, and we are in installing defibrillators all across the most crowded areas of the Supreme Court. So God forbid, if you require to resuscitate and save any member of the bar, uh, they are going to be available. The Delhi government and the Union of India were very cooperative, and they have helped in setting them up for us. Every morning, I have 
over a hundred matters which are mentioned in the Chief Justice's court, sometimes a figure goes up to 120. Now I learned my own ways and how we can do that in about half an hour to about 40 minutes. I was once asked, is this not a waste of time for the Chief Justice to be spending half an hour in the first part of the day taking up mentioning matters? That's not the way I look at it. And the reason why I hear these mentioning matters is very simple. I felt that it's important for us to send a message of confidence among members of the bar. That if you have an urgent matter, your matter would be heard and it would be listed at the earliest. Equally important, in that one half of an hour, we send a message to citizens at large that if there is something arbitrary which is being done to you, your home is being demolished, or you are being subjected to an arbitrary arrest, there is someone in the country who will give you a voice immediately. <laughs> Much as we are a constitutional court, and that is why we now have a permanent constitution bench which is running, that is one of my uh, initiatives which I have adopted, we must have a permanent constitutional bench running through the year. But equally, we are a court for common citizens, and it's important for us to balance the two perspectives. I'm grateful to you for all the confidence which you have vested in us as a team of judges. Nothing can be done by the Chief Justice without the assistance of his colleagues or their, of the colleagues. And my colleagues have given me some great and under, unstinted cooperation over the last five months. I thought I must share with you that since 9th November 2022, when I took over till the 11th of April 2023, 22,208 cases were filed in the Supreme Court. 1,4,000 cases were listed, and 22,054 cases have been disposed of. So we are just about 100 cases behind schedule, which we'll cover up in a matter of two days. But that's also because we are now listing Wednesdays and Thursdays as regular hearing days, where your progress is slower. But that's where, by, by doing that, we are listing some of the oldest cases as well. To give you comparative figures, in the 11 months of 2022, 35,791 cases were filed in the Supreme Court. At the rate which we have achieved of filing between the 1st of January and the 11th of April, we are anticipating that the filing would have gone up to about 57,000 cases this year. So we are, as opposed to 35,000 cases which were filed last year, and these were not pandemic figures, 57,000 is what we are expecting to be filed, and I can assure you that we will dispose of 57,000 cases and not add to the backlog this year. <laughs> Every evening I get a report from the Registrar General, from the Secretary General and the Registrar in charge of listing in regard to the matters which are verified and how many are pending for verification. On an average, 190 to 200 matters are verified every single day, and about 195 are diarized every day. We have set up specialized benches. This was something which was the need for the hour. We have a bench which is dealing only with land acquisition cases. Justice Suryakant is heading that bench. We have a specialized bench which deals with MSAT and compensation cases. Justice Bopanna is dealing with that bench. We have a specialized arbitration bench. Justice Ravindra Bhatt is dealing with arbitration and indirect tax. Justice Amar Shah deals with direct tax. Justice Gawai very graciously agreed when I requested him to take up criminal appeals, as well as the death references. There were about 26 death references which were pending. Taking up death references is not a very simple task for a judge. It's the most difficult part of a life of a judge in a way. But Justice Gawai agreed very readily and said that he will take up and dispose of the death references, and therefore that bench is dealing with that. I thought we must emphasize personal liberty, and therefore every bench in the Supreme Court takes up bail applications in the morning, likewise transfer petitions in the morning. I've taken up all the Section 11 Arbitration Act matters which were pending since 2017. For five years, Section 11 matters had not been disposed of. We are down to the last less than 50 matters which are now pending. I don't want to take too much of time, maybe just two or three minutes and I'll be done to give you just a broad idea of the flavor of work which goes on apart from the judicial work. I'd constituted a committee chaired by Justice Narsimha for the classification of cases. Many of the classification codes which we had introduced since 2006 onwards 
had become redundant. There were no filings at all under those classification codes. We need new codes for the purpose of ensuring that we can manage litigation better, assign cases to judges and dispose them off. Uh, the committee has consulted with SCORA as well as SCBA. The report, just as Narsimha tells me, is almost ready. Every day when we have a cup of tea, we'll always leave a little quickly because he has to attend a meeting of the classification committee. Uh, great work has been done by that committee. Justice Ravindra Bhatt is carrying out a disability audit of the Supreme Court premises because we want to ensure that the Supreme Court is disability friendly. It's friendly for the disabled individuals. We have installed now gender neutral bathrooms within the toilets within the Supreme Court. That was one of the demands which I had received that there should be gender neutral uh, toilets as well. There should be toilets for transgender. So we have that in place in the Supreme Court. I must tell you that we had a law clerk scheme. The idea, I mean, this is not something which necessarily uh, relates to the members of the bar, but I'd like to share just a moment of reflection on this. I was rather keen that we must have an open and transparent process of recruiting law clerks. Because when we recruit law clerks to assist the Supreme Court judges, we are also training lawyers for the future. That's part of our obligation of giving back to the members of the bar, just as, of course, the law clerks help us a great deal in doing a little bit of our research and helping with some of our speeches. But I thought it's very important that we must have law clerks from across India, and not just those who are connected, those who come with recommendations, not just lawyers' children or lawyers' relatives. We must have young lawyers who, who have no connections whatsoever, who come and apply as part of a system and who are recruited. So I requested Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, my senior most colleague, to chair the committee. The committee came out with a white paper, based on a white paper which I had spent the whole summer last year in preparing. And we have a new scheme. We are going to have uh, an examination in early in May. The idea of the examination is not to test the memorization capacity of the lawyer, because that's not what is relevant in a court. What is relevant is analytical skills. So it will be a two-part examination, multiple choice questions, 300 marks. And thereafter, we are going to give two, two questions over three and a half hours. One question will be to prepare a brief from a mock judgment, and then a research paper, half an hour to read the exam, and then two questions. And the two questions, the answer should not exceed 750 words each. So the idea is to test your analytical skills. I must tell you that my law clerks come from absolutely unconnected backgrounds from all over the country. None of them comes from a legal family. And they are doing some brilliant work. So that's part of our process of opening up the Supreme Court to citizens at large and sending us a message of confidence to young lawyers across the country. As part of the Collegium, my emphasis has been on promoting transparency in the Collegium. As you all know, we put up reasons for the resolutions which we pass, whether it is in terms of appointment of judges of the High Court, whether it is in terms of appointment of chief justices, transfers of judges, dealing with representations of judges. Another initiative which we have taken is to, uh, to dovetail the work of the Center for Research and Planning in the Supreme Court with the permanent secretariat of the Supreme Court, which deals with judicial appointments. The Center for Research and Planning has some extraordinarily talented young people, including young judicial officers whom I've recruited. It is headed by an officer from the Punjab and Haryana High Court, a young Dalit student who was my former law clerk, who has come back now from Jindal Global Law University after doing a LLM at Harvard Law School. So we have a set of talented people. We have appointments which will be due in the summer this year, when the retirements next, next set of retirements take place in the Supreme Court. So I thought I'd, I'll tell the CRP, why don't we collect data of the top 50 judges in the country? This was never done. So we now have in place data pertaining to the top 50 judges in order of seniority. So we have their judgments before us. We have the number of reportable judgments which they have delivered. The idea is to promote a sense of objectivity in the work which the Collegium does. So the center of research and planning will now uh, merge, so to speak, its activities with the permanent secretariat of the Chief Justice of India. Just two more initiatives and I'll be done. I'll just share them with you very briefly. We thought that we must reach out to citizens in the language which they understand, which is not English. 
I was the Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court for three years, and very often the only English which would begin and end was with, please your lordship, and thereafter it would be a Hindi conversation between me and the members of the bar. And I was very happy to do that because I thought I could reach out to the members of the bar in language which they spoke, which they understood, which was close to their heart. So I requested, I requested Justice Abhay Oak, who is part, in the, part of the audience. I thought I can share all this because my colleagues are here. Justice Abhay Oak is heading a committee for translation of judgments. We are using artificial intelligence for translation of all the judgments of the Supreme Court. There are 34,000 judgments of the Supreme Court, and we are going to do it for orders as well, prospectively to start with, in all the Indian languages which are recognized under the Constitution. About 4,000 plus judgments, Justice Oak will have the latest figures, but more than 4,000 judgments have already been translated. Most of them in Hindi, but the other languages as well. The scheme which Justice Oak devised was that there will be retired just district judges in every high court who will be budgeted for by the Supreme Court of India, but they will verify the machine translation which is taking place under a software which has been provided by the IIT at Madras. We are also implementing neutral citations so that now when cases are cited in the Supreme Court, judgments are cited in the Supreme Court, we should have one universal mode of citation across India. The Delhi High Court first did that. There was a committee chaired by Justice Rajiv Shagdar which did that. The Kerala High Court did that. Justice Vijay, Raja Vijayaraghavan did that in Kerala and is Justice Mohammed Mushtaq and a lot of other colleagues in the ICT committee. We constituted a committee in the Supreme Court, and we have now neutral citations in place. I must also tell you that members of the bar have wholeheartedly co uh, cooperated. Mr. Arunishwar Gupta is in the audience. He gave the entire data that he had for neutral citations, which we have picked up. And I spoke to him to thank him that he didn't claim any copyright in the uh, data. He said to me in a jest that, uh, Chief Justice, I earn enough money at the bar then to make money on this little copyright which I have. So all in all, I must tell you that the work which we are doing is a work in a collaborative capacity. I only sit there and facilitate the activities of my colleagues. I give them my ideas. They revert back to me. We share thoughts. All of them, apart from doing their judicial work, do this remarkable work of the court during the course of the evenings. We are going ahead with live streaming as well. As you know, we have already started live streaming the Constitution bench hearings. Uh, in the uh, Constitution bench, which heard the, uh, the Maharashtra issue, uh, we had live transcripts of the uh, arguments, so that what was argued by the lawyers was instantaneously put on the screen. At the end of the day, it was cleaned up, and we have a whole text of the arguments. And I'm sure we'll be able to, we've already put out an expression of interest so that we can make it now a part of our system. I've constituted a committee of my own colleagues for now implementing live streaming. I began by saying that these colleagues who are on the dais bring such rich experience to the, uh, to the Supreme Court. So I've requested those colleagues who implemented live streaming in their own high courts to chair the committee and to work on the committee so that we can have modalities for live streaming proceedings of the Supreme Court. So I believe Justice Oak is on that committee, Justice Arvind Kumar is on the committee. Uh, so, so many of our colleagues who have this diverse experience, one of the problems which I always felt, and let me conclude with that, was that though we have such tremendous experience as judges of the High Court and as Chief Justices of the High Court, when we land up here, nobody seems to ever tap our experiences in the Supreme Court. We are then reduced only to being judges and nothing else, and perhaps doing work with single judges of the High Court do as in the case of the grant of bail. So I thought that we must change this pattern in the Supreme Court. Because this enormous experience which judges of the high courts bring with them when they come to the Supreme Court must be tapped into. Because this is not the personal turf or property of the Chief Justice of India. I always felt that the Supreme Court of India is a Chief Justice driven court. That has to change. The Chief Justice in a sense is the is a friend for everyone among the colleagues. Somebody may call him the primus inter pairs. It's a Latin word which means first amongst equals. But we do the same judicial work. And I do believe that I must end this by thanking my colleagues who are here in the audience. I'm sorry I took this 20 minutes of time, but you know these opportunities are rare and it's important to seize them. 
I must thank my colleagues on behalf of all of you for the work which they are doing uh, in the Supreme Court, not just by burning the midnight oil and making sure that those SLPs are disposed of, not dismissed, but disposed of, <laughs> <laughs> but, all, but also in terms of uh, upgrading the infrastructure of the Supreme Court. Uh, all of you have spoken about the need for the lawyers' chambers. Please rest assured, it is extremely close to my heart. Uh, this is something we are all working on together. If lawyers, we created, when I was the Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court, we set up the new bench of the, uh, at Lucknow, which was completely moribund until I took over. And we uh, constructed a large number of chambers for lawyers. When the president of the Bar Association came to thank me, I said, look, there is a little bit of self-interest in it also. So he said, sir, what is your name? So I said to him, what is your name? It's so much. When lawyers are occupied, it's always safe for the institution. So, <laughs> thank you very much.